Hi, welcome. My name is Chris Temple, and uh, this is the session on deploying Linux in safety critical applications, three key challenges. I am a lead safety and reliability system architect at ARM, uh, working out of the ARM office in Germany. So uh, the work that I'm presenting is work we have uh, conducted in the context of the uh, open source project ELISA. And the ELISA project is about enabling Linux in safety applications. It's not about providing a safety conform kernel. And I'll explain in the next slide why I'm emphasizing this. Uh, yeah, and this presentation will now look at and lead you through three key challenges and, and, and solution ideas um, on, on enabling Linux in, in safety applications. So what is this about the difference between safety versus conformance? So safety is about the absence of uh, unreasonable risk. And um, it's a property of the system that is experienceable while conformance is defined as to be or act in accord with a set of standards, expectations, or specifications. Often you hear safety and conformance used in the same sentences. The reason is that there are a lot of safety standards, which are actually safety integrity standards. And uh, there is a strong desire to be conform to those safety standards. But as I've illustrated here on the figure, conformance does not automatically imply safety. So you can have systems that are not conformed to a safety standard and are not safe. You can have systems that actually conform to a safety standard, but still unsafe. You, in the ideal case, um, can have systems that are safe and conform to safety standards. That's clearly the, the target area that one wants to be in. And there are also reasons when you can have systems that are safe and maybe in some areas don't quite conform to the standards. And the safety standards actually take this into account by using a language of highly recommended and recommended rather than mandatory uh, for the requirements set forward in the standard. So, so that allows some, some areas of gray because in some cases there is good reason to not conform to a specific um, clause of, of the safety standard, but that still uh, ensures safety. So safety is the objective, safety engineering is the approach and conformance is an additional constraint uh, that one wants to achieve in the quest of achieving safety. Now, I already used the term safety integrity in respect to the standards. So what, how, how do safety and safety integrity go hand in hand? So safety and the way that one achieves sufficient control of, of dangerous failure modes is done through safety claims. And the safety claims state specific safety capabilities of the system or, or one of the, the system elements. Um, and it's, it's expressed in form of safety requirements. And the safety requirements clearly depend on the context. So, so the, the typical example that one frequently uh, reads or hears about is, is an airbag system. And uh, the safety claim for an airbag system is twofold. On the one hand, it should deploy in the event of an accident. That's the purpose of, of the airbag. But there is another safety claim, which is almost takes more engineering effort to, to fulfill. And that is that the airbag should not deploy inadvertently when you are not in an accident. And, and the reason is quite straightforward. If the airbag deploys and flies into your face, then that most likely will cause you to engage in an accident because it might knock you unconscious, blind you or whatever. It's a, it's a pretty massive experience having an airbag deploy. Um, and it's not something you want to experience, for example, while you're driving on the motorway, but you're sitting the whole time behind the airbag and the airbag, the squib is there. So the potential for the airbag deploying is, is high. It, it, it's, it's there and um, you don't want that to happen outside of a crash. So 
the key question is when you start engineering solutions for your safety claims, the question is what, how, how much effort do you put in? And this is where safety integrity uh, comes into play. And the idea is that if the probability of a hazardous event or the um, controllability of the hazard events by a human or the severity of the consequence is very low, then clearly you, it makes sense to put less effort into substantiating the safety claim than if those are very high, right? If, if, if you're very exposed to the, to the, to the risk, if, if the, the severity of, of the injuries you might experience is fatal, uh, and if the controllability is very low, so there's not much you can do as a driver, or as a human engaged in the surrounding of the car, then clearly you have to apply a much higher level of, of, of rigor. And this is explained through the, the, the safety integrity, and that expresses the degree of rigor that is taken to substantiate a specific safety claim. And this is expressed in terms of safety integrity levels. So these are the famous ASILs in the ISO 26262 standard uses A, B, C, and D, with A being the, the lowest level of safety integrity and D marking and denoting the highest level of safety integrity. And, and, and the safety standards, which really could be seen as safety integrity standards, describe all the things you need to do to substantiate safety integrity for specific safety claims. And then the, the system you build, you have to ensure that the safety capability is, is met with the stated degree of rigor. And uh, lastly, the idea of safety engineering is to provide a safety case as a, as a structured argument supported by evidence to justify that a system or a safety element fulfills the safety claim with the stated safety integrity. So, so this is a very, very high level picture explaining how these different aspects uh, fit together. So apart from expressing the desire for a safety integrity level, a key question clearly is what are the safety claims that one needs to fulfill? And that in the context of the ELISA project has formed one of the challenges and pulled together now a simple model to explain how one can obtain uh, necessary safety claims without necessarily having to dig into all possible applications because an operating system clearly is something quite generic. So you can envision a magnitude, almost any digital system you build will have some kind of operating system in there. And then having to analyze that system context to derive requirements for the operating system is, is, is tedious. So the idea is to use a simple model to start identifying some of the key requirements um, that need to be substantiated so that the ELISA project can look at how, how to enable the use of, of Linux in these safety applications. So here is um, a simple model. It's two applications, A1, A2. Each application has an application context. And um, in very, very general hand-waving terms, the applications produce output based on input and the internal context within uh, some deadline. I, I, I think that's a, a fairly reasonable model for, for a control system. Um, it, it's not outrageously complex. And um, that's the whole idea of starting with something simple. Then we have an operating system. Uh, that operating system also has a context. The operating system, again, very simple model, provides services to facilitate timely progress. That will be everything to do with, with scheduling and, 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 and maintaining system timers and so on and so forth. It provides services for maintaining uh, the context of the application. And it manages underlying hardware. And then the third component, the third level would be hardware uh, with a hardware context. And that also provides services to facilitate timely progress. So, so that is clearly the, the hardware implementation, for example, of, of timers um, and interrupts and other, other hardware facilities. And it also provides services for maintaining the context that, that that's all the instruction set 
um, that that the the underlying processor provides and 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 other services. So the first thing I, I one can look at because I, I picked the simple stuff first uh, to get it off the table is uh, timing. So we can look at this 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 list we we just put together and we say okay the the, the operating system provides services to facilitate timely progress and the hardware does the same thing. Um, what happens if those things go bad? And basically, there are two established techniques for um, dealing with that. There is a technique in software that are typically applied using deadline monitoring. So if you can see that the the, the system misses its it, it scheduled deadlines, uh, you try to take some corrective action. Uh, this is a gigantic field because it depends on the, the, the scheduling requirements. It depends on your application requirements. But there are established solutions. There are established puzzle pieces that can be obtained through which one can create a mitigation story for these timing problems. And then on the hardware side, it goes starting from uh, hardware and clock and, and timing monitoring circuits starting very simple thing either you have a, a second oscillator and you cross check the clock or you have an rc based frequency monitoring circuits um and you build monitoring circuits this is not a complete list this is just an, an example but there is tons of art available to to prior art to to read and uh, there are a lot of solutions of this kind already available and implemented so this is not really it, it's challenging, but it, it, it's not super novel uh, to, to, to look at. On the, the hardware context sides, again, what happens? How can you deal with those problems? And um, one area that is being used, again, as an example, is our privilege based security architectures. Um, more and more. The hardware processors are supporting privilege-based systems, and this is across the industry. It's, it's ARM has, has very sophisticated uh, support for security, as well as x86 and, and, and other processor architectures. And the security problem already brings a lot of mechanisms and techniques um, to isolate the applications from critical hardware accesses, but also isolating the applications from from one another because you don't want one application snooping around in the data space of, a, of another application from a security perspective. And that is the same that you don't want one application inadvertently modifying uh, the context of another application from a safety perspective. And in addition, which is quite nice, there is more and more a bigger and bigger number of products emerging that have safe, they're built on a safety enabled hardware architecture. So th that includes things like split lock cores to detect random hardware folds. There are safety islands available to perform platform safety management. Internal SOC data paths are all covered with uh, parity bits and, and error correcting control. Um, there are additional bespoke error detection mechanisms dealing with specific dedicated peripherals. So there are software test capabilities and hardware scan diagnostics available and there is memory based available. So there are extensive feature sets available and more and more semiconductor manufacturers are actually certifying their products and the mechanisms they provide to ensure safety at the hardware level uh, to certain safety integrity levels. So now we cross off those problems. We say, okay, that's again, challenging, but, but we, it, you know, there, there are solutions out there. Puzzle pieces are available. So um, now we look at the application context, right? So we say there are really two challenges. The one is we need measures that ensure that an application cannot corrupt another application context, the context of the operating system, or the context of the hardware in an undetected dangerous way. And the second challenge is the OS itself shall not corrupt 
the context of the application, the context of the OS, or the context of the hardware, again, in an undetected dangerous way. You can already see I'm, 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 the language is chosen intentionally a little tricky because these are starting to get quite challenging problems and you need to be certain that you're not setting the bar too high. So saying in an undetected dangerous way, that means that if corruption can occur, but it's detectable or it is not dangerous in the sense that it does not violate the safety claim, uh, then the corruption might be okay to live with. Otherwise, you start running into the risk of, of intensely over-engineering the system, which is to, to nobody's benefit. Um, on the uh, so 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 what what solutions do we have at hand for for these problems? And um, I already said that the measures that ensure that the application itself cannot be the source of corruption of other contexts in the system, uh, there are techniques available to, to address that. As, as said, right, the, the, the privilege-based security architectures, uh, if you add sufficient safety integrity to those mechanisms, you, you get very powerful techniques to address this problem. There are very, very um, sophisticated virtualization techniques available these days supported by the underlying hardware architecture that give additional ways of, of establishing containers and other uh, techniques to, to mitigate and address this, this, this cross interference. And it's possible to exploit specific application properties, and I'll get to that uh, point further on in the presentation to explain how, how that works. So, so we're left kind of with this question, um, okay, the OS itself shall not corrupt the context either of the application of itself or of the hardware in an undetected dangerous way. And now the question is, how, how can that be, how can that be achieved? So, on the next slide, I'll present some uh, selected solution knobs. I, I, this is by no means complete. There are tons of ideas. There are tons of ideas emerging in the ELISA project. Um, but these are, I think, some main knobs that are available to turn and, and see and try to, to hum in on addressing this problem. So on the left side, I, I, I simply repeat the problem that we're trying to look at, uh, which is how can we, what can we do to ensure that the OS itself doesn't become the source of, of context corruption? And a very simple solution would be the choice of an operating system. So um, there are operating systems available built based on microkernels and, and separation kernels. Microkernels go back all the way to the 1970s. Uh, separation kernels go back to uh, 1981 to work that John Rushby did. And um, the benefit is that the the kernel is built around the idea of having hardware firmware software mechanisms to establish isolate and separate multiple execution partitions and to perform the control information flow between the subjects that that's the the, the term used by the NSA definition and exported resources allocated to those partitions. So, so the operating system, the kernel, is really built around this whole idea of separation. The con, and there is literature out there to read through what mechanisms that performance impact emerges, is, is a performance impact. Under certain constraints and assumptions that impact can be taken to a lower level, but there is still a performance impact and it is not off the shelf uh, Linux, which is not the target we have set ourselves for the ELISA project. So we want to see how, how can we enable Linux in the safety critical applications. Examples, if, if anyone's interested for, for microkernels is our, our QNX or VxWorks. And uh, for separation kernels, it's, it's integrity or links um, to, to, to name a few examples. So we say, okay, we want to use uh, Linux. So an obvious approach is to say, let's harden the operating system. What, what does it take? 
write one key um, technique in hardening is, is scope reduction and feature stripping, right? Everything that isn't there and isn't used is something that can't go wrong and can't be a cause of, of, of interference and corruption, um, except that a lot of Linux people are quite stressed when, when you tell them, you know, what, what can you do away with? Because all the features in Linux are there for a good reason. And the more you strip away from it, uh, the less it, it still resembles the original intention of Linux with all the good features that, that have been built in. I mean, if you, if you strip it down radically, you take out the scheduler, you take out, out tons of, of, of features, you reduce the device drivers, eventually you're, you're going to resemble something that's starting to look close to, to a microkernel, um, but it, it's then not, not, not Linux anymore. Then what we just said on the application side, using hardware security and virtualization features is, is, is a good technique. Uh, there are limits in Linux to how far you can take those features into the kernel, uh, with the exception of um, features that the hardware provides that are, that are transparent to the operating system. And there are techniques of hardening the OS using um, inline checking and context signing. That's also an a, a, a established technique to, to secure a context. The problem with uh, inline checking and context signing are pure software approaches and they impose a significant overhead because really every context information that you use, every time you use it, you really would need to check whether it's corrupted or at least have a good argument that if you're using it at a certain point and it is corrupted, you will eventually uncover that problem downstream so it won't be an undetected uh, dangerous violation of your safety claim. And, and those arguments are, are very, very sophisticated to lead. So, so the, the cons of, of hardening is, is the overhead and uh, the performance impact of monitoring and context signing. It, it, it's, it can be taken to the point where, where the performance of the operating system becomes wiped away by all these additional checks that, that have been added, added uh, to the code. So this is important. It, it cannot address the whole problem and we can't work with black and white arguments. We're gonna have to put a puzzle together. So this, contains important puzzle pieces. And the, the key is to find the right spots in the kernel where these arguments help without overdoing it and creating too many disadvantages. Then the next knob that one can apply is what I call correct by construction testing. So what you, the argument is that you say we have tested a certain piece of code so extensively that we have a huge faith in the integrity of, um, of that code. And there are areas and today software engineering has advanced to the point that in some cases these arguments are used. They're used successfully in, in safety systems today that are in the field. Uh, it's always a matter of, of the complexity that you're looking at. So again, you, the big benefit is that there is low or no runtime performance impact because you're saying I, I, I can test the code to this level of perfection before I deploy it. And there are lots of new uh, methods for testing software. And, and the good thing is that the open source community is really very, very active in adopting these methods for Linux and also developing and driving methods for, for, for testing. Uh, so this is a really, really interesting aspect. The, on the con side, the correct by construction testing requires really some prerequisites, right? So the standard, the ISO standard itself kind of suggests, highly recommends that for these kind of arguments, you have one entry and one exit point. You use restricted use of pointers, uh, no unconditional jumps, etc., because else you're just facing a state space explosion when everything can continuously be interrupted by something else and all the cogs are spinning and turning simultaneously. The, the test space it gets, gets immensely big. 
Um, I, I'm, I, I think this has a lot of value. I think it forms a really important puzzle piece. I, I personally am always a little doubtful whether that can be the sole argumentation. And it reminds me of the shortest joke amongst computer programmers. Uh, in a room, I'd ask if everyone knows it. I'll, I'll just uh, share it with you. It's two words. The shortest joke is last bug. So we looked at testing. We looked at using uh, runtime features. And here is a really, really interesting knob and a way of achieving the goal of enabling Linux in safety application. And that is by exploiting application properties. This is largely how it is done today in many systems that use Linux. So a lot of people say, why are you even struggling in the ELISA project? I, I already heard about a system that uses Linux. But the key question is how much of the safety argumentation of that application actually pivots on safety claims made by the operating system and how much is done by putting the safety mitigation around the operating system or into external hardware and not relying on the operating system. This was a crude example simply to show that there is a complete rainbow coloring of, of options, what, how one can conceive applications. I've simply, for, for reasons of simplicity, separated them into a class L and a class H. The class L I've, I've crudely labeled low safety complexity. This is not scientific. Just, just take this with a, with a grain of salt. It, it's to, to put two stakes in the ground uh, rather than to have a, an exact science. Typically, in the, the low complexity safety systems, transient faults are not that critical. And I'll give an example in a second of, of such a system. Those systems have a high low pass characteristic, so the transient fault just gets wiped out by the, uh, the, by the low pass characteristics of, of the applications. Permanent faults are, are critical. The fault tolerance time compared to the execution speed of the system is long, so you have quite a long time in which a fault can be present in the system before something dangerous happens. Very, very often you will see a human in the loop, which is very convenient. Uh, because the human can do some additional plausibility checking and intervene. And since the fault tolerance time is, is low, there is still time for the human uh, to, to actually do something. In many cases, end-to-end -end plausibility checking at the application level is, is plausible. You don't so often see arguments for mixed criticality where the system has to achieve multiple safety claims that are independent from one another and require uh, applications of different criticality being integrated. And usually, and again, right, just as a stake in the ground, uh, you're looking at safety integrity levels up to ASIL B. A, a very typical use case, one that's also being considered in the ELISA project is our, our IVI telltale. So it's, you can imagine a digital dashboard and uh, the critical failure mode is if a warning telltale that's trying to inform the driver that something critical has occurred and it needs to take action doesn't appear at the TFT display. And those systems usually use some kind of feedback loop, for example, by taking the bitmap from the TFT, feeding it through an image detection algorithm and actually checking whether the, um, whether the telltale is, is visible. And um, if it isn't visible, it tries to alert the driver in a different way by, by using audio, by, by turning off the dashboard, by switching to an emergency dashboard, or there are a whole bunch of techniques uh, that, that, that are established in the industry. That's on the, on the low end side of complexity. And, and as you can see, that fulfills the criteria of class L. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the, the class H, which is a high safety complexity. Uh, in those systems, transient faults are, are, are critical. So, so you don't really have a low pass characteristic that you can use in your safety argumentation. Permanent faults are critical. And um, there is uh, the fault tolerance time is short, so there are only milliseconds left to, to react. It, it's not really possible to engage the driver or a human in the loop. End-to-end um, -end plausibility checking at the application level is not that, that feasible. And very, very often you're looking at mixed criticality systems going all the way up to ASLD. So uh, that I depicted now on the right, uh, which would be autonomous driving systems. 
and uh, then there are a whole bunch of systems in between. Gateway systems, for example, are, are, are usually still considered more towards the class H because there's no human, there's no uh, um, low pass characteristic in the loop. Um, and then the EGAS, I'm not sure whether to what extent this is known. I presented that last year. Uh, that is basically the safety architecture that has been developed and is in use across most of the cars for the electronic uh, throttle control. So, so the accelerator pedal these days just goes to a sensor and then the signal is sent to the engine control unit to control the speed of the car. And that is done using a, a system that's called EGAS, um, which is higher than the telltale use case, I would, I would believe. Um, but it is, is still in more towards the lower end of, of the safety complexity ballpark. The good thing is this is a very, very powerful knob. Uh, the, the challenge is it introduces this application property dependency. So what we're trying to do in the ELISA project is engage with OEMs and trying to get them to provide us with the most interesting use cases they have. So if we do want to resort to application properties and to this technique, we, we, we focus on the use cases that are of the biggest interest uh, to the OEMs in the ELISA project rather than do, trying to solve a problem that, that, that has no relevance. And the industrial team in the ELISA project, I've now spoken all about, about automotive. The industrial team is doing the same thing. They have, they have chosen specific uh, use cases and that allows them to reach out to this knob and twist that knob and say, okay, we're, we're limiting now our, our enablement for, for Linux to this particular use case. I, the big risk is just that someone enables um, Linux for use in, in, in one class and someone else isn't aware of this class dependency and says, hooray, the problem has been dissolved. And because Linux is running in this kind of system, I can take it and put it into a different kind of system and I must be able to reuse the arguments. And, and I think this slide hopefully shows that that is not necessarily the case. If you do transfer arguments, you have to be really, really careful that the constraints under which those arguments were met still remain valid. So, the, the, the last challenge to discuss is the integration challenge, right? So, so supposing now we have we have Linux, we have put put all these arguments in place, uh, we've hardened it, we've we've used application dependent uh, aspects to 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 mitigate and address some of the critical faults, and um, now we need to put it together. And the way this is done typically is that the different constituents for integration, so it's the operating system that has to be integrated with hardware, with drivers, with all kinds of bits and pieces, um, libraries, you name it. Um, and typically those individual elements are developed and provided a safety element out of context. The safety element out of context means it's a safety element, so it fulfills some safety claims with a stated safety integrity, but it has been developed using an assumed context by a supplier because the supplier says, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm assuming this is, for example, going to be used in an airbag. And they use these application constraints um, techniques to, to argue the safety capability of, of that element. So those elements come with integration requirements and they are really critical. And typically those integration requirements are stated in the safety manual. And the safety manual now contains the assumptions on the context that the supplier has made and the integration requirements that are usually stated as, as assumptions of use requirements, which are safety requirements allocated to the integrator. In practice, this has turned to be quite challenging because the person integrating all these different elements is now facing um, a challenging task. The integrator needs to ensure that the safety claims are sufficient, that the assumptions made by the supplier are valid, and that the assumptions of use that the supplier has expressed for his safety element are addressed with a sufficient integrity. And then, and this is something I think that software programmers and kernel programmers will understand immediately, when you start integrating things, sometimes properties disappear. So you have to make sure that the safety properties that the element had before you integrated are still there. 
and you have to ensure that the safety claims that don't emerge until you have achieved integration actually emerged as desired. And lastly, which is really, really ugly, you have to ensure that no new critical failure modes have emerged. So this integration challenge also puts a limit on the level of creativity that you can apply if, 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 if your enablement of Linux in your safety application hinges on, on 100 assumptions and 2000 integration requirements, it's going to be almost impossible for anyone to, to take that operating system and integrate it in an intelligent way and still have confidence at the end of the day that, that the safety is still maintained, right? So that automatically puts a bound to the, to the extensity and the creativity of the arguments. It, it kind of forces everyone back into a world of reason and sanity and saying it, it has to be a, a reasonably safe, a reasonably simple solution to be able to, to demonstrate safety and argue safety at the end. And, and typically in ECU, uh, when we did this on, on a particular autonomous driving system, we within no time, within a couple of hours, we suddenly found 100 safety elements. Uh, different software drivers, different hardware parts, the, the, the power management unit from the hardware that, that needs to, that needs some in, periodic engagement with, with software and, and so on and so forth. It was quite amazing how, how complex um, this problem became. And, and there is, a, if you're interested, I, I presented the paper at a con European Dependable Computing Conference uh, about a month ago where I, I went into detail of this problem and, and we were discussing how, how, what options exist to solve it. So the conclusion of this presentation is really the, the safety argumentation that we pulled together in the ELISA project uh, will require making trade-offs um, and it requires collecting multiple puzzle pieces and combining them in a smart way. This is, I think, the challenge for the project today it would be much easier if we would have make or break arguments because then you can throw away all the weak ones and you're left with one argument that's the killer argument that is very unlikely to emerge it's more that there are a lot of arguments each one can carrying a small weight of the overall argument and it's the combination of those arguments um, that actually enables the use of, of linux in the safety application so all the pieces are needed uh, Someone at the end of the day will have to understand all the pieces to gain confidence that the combination of the pieces delivers a sufficient argumentation and the ELISA project is, is now working on, on solving the, the puzzle and, and looking for new pieces um, that could be used to, to argument and justify the safety. That, that concludes my presentation and um, thank you for listening.